Hello, everybody. It is great to be here one more time today. And my name's Gary Fowler, and I am the CEO, President, and Founder of GSD Get You Done Venture Studios, a premier AI and quantum venture studio located in the heart of Silicon Valley. We believe that intellectual capacity is evenly spread around the world and opportunities are not. And with that, I have an incredible guest today. I'd like to introduce Nick Larson. He's a serial founder, a CRO and community builder. He's a host of Silicon Zombies. He's an all around nice guy. He is the current Chief Revenue Officer of Unity Central. With that, I'd like to bring Nick on board. Hi, Nick. How are you doing today? Hey, Gary. Thanks for having me. Good morning. Yeah, it's good to see you. Oh, my light has to go up. Hold on a second. There. So tell me a little bit about it. So you went to San Jose State University. And you got started. Yep. You became an account executive right out of school. So what was that journey like? How do you go from being an account executive to building companies? Uh yeah, thanks for the question. Through a lot of scrapes and bruises and, and learning lessons along the way. But uh, as long as you surround yourself with good people um, and uh, continue to adapt, uh, good things will happen. So what's the deal, Nick? What's the magic of Silicon Valley? Um, you know, I, I think it's the ecosystem. You, you've got the, the, the top universities in the world. Um, then you also have the the, the top uh, the top companies as well, who uh, who will not only push the envelope for innovation, uh, but also hire folks. And uh, it, you know they say that there's just like kind of something in the water, um, but there's this this idea of building good things with good people that attracts folks from from all around. So it's really is a pretty special place. It is more of a, an ethos now. So, I mean, what have you seen? So, you you know, you got involved in, in 2008, you got involved in small only. So what have you seen? That was about the time of the financial crisis. How did Silicon Valley deal with the financial crisis? Well, it was I was kind of fortunate because I was uh, still in school then. So it's, it's almost it was like a protective bubble. Um, I mean, yeah, a lot of people lost a lot of money. I think a, a lot of people also made a lot of money. You know, they say... Um, when there's blood in this in the streets, that's when you're supposed to invest. Um, we also saw the the Fed push uh, push interest rates to to zero, and that was I guess what probably like a couple of years ago. Uh, I, I think that ended up being pretty impactful and in finding right opportunities. Um, yeah, so it, it's changed quite a bit, but um, it, you can stay ahead of the curve by uh, kind of knowing where the where the puck is headed. Uh, that's one of my favorite quotes. Skate to where the puck is is headed, not to where the puck is, right? Yeah, no, that's right. And so, you know, as you're going down through your entrepreneurial journey, you went from account manager to account executive. Then you started, uh, you were at Protolysis. Uh, then you went from, how did you go from Umnitsa to uh, Evlo? Sure. Good. Appreciate the question. Uh, so Umnitsa is an IT asset management technology. Uh, in fact, one of my buddies from college started it. Um, shout out to Ramin. And yeah, I really like the process of, of building companies. It's it's super exciting to me just because it's everything happens so quickly. And I'm just a big fan of innovation. You know, my, my brother and I, we, we grew up uh, on computers. My mom worked at Apple for 30 years. Um, in fact, I got to meet Jobs when I was twelve, which is which is pretty neat. Was so, nice? um, was Jobs nice, Nick. Uh, you know, he was nice to me. Uh, he, he, it was definitely like a strong aura around him, um, and, and piercing eyes. But I, you know, I just shook his hand. I didn't, I didn't give him like design feedback or or anything like that. But Gary, as as for your question, you know, just uh, you know, being able to go from uh, the technology space and software and and taking lessons along the way and, and applying them to uh, to solving new problems. You know, that's right. And and as you went down through this journey, what? It, so how did you go? But when you went, who needs to, by the way, it's that's interesting. That's uh, sounds like a Russian. Um, yeah, it is. And when you, yeah. went to, when you went to Evlo, how did you go from being an account executive to what was that evolution like? And how did you get that job at Evlo or how did what how did you create the company? Yeah, so so I I was the CEO at Evlo, so that was kind of uh, hey, I'm going to leave my job with a, with a um, a co-founder um, mm -hmm. at, at a different company, and we're going to kick this thing off. So um, it wasn't my first time as a as a founder, so I I had had a couple losses or I guess learning lessons uh, be, before that. 
Um, yeah, it was really exciting though. We we were uh, working out of the Wilson Sonsini incubator um, right in uh, downtown San Francisco in Soma, and you know, come to find out, like, but probably six years later, I would I would start One Piece, which had our San Francisco location at four one four Brandon, maybe like two blocks away. So pretty pretty again, like pretty small, fascinating ecosystem of technology. So you went and you went from Evlo. How did you go back to VP of sales? What was that like? Well, Evlo or everything local, we we crashed and burned. We we raised some capital, did about eighty thousand in revenue, and ultimately the the company failed. Um, which is you know it's painful going through the process, but it's it's definitely important to. Uh, it's like street cred, right? Like if if you don't uh, if you you don't burn a couple of the dishes, you you don't know how to how to cook, I guess. Um, I, I hope that answered your question, Gary. Yeah, no, it's interesting. But the, how did it feel going from that? Uh, was it hard to go from being a CEO to being a VP of Sales? No, because you know I I knew that there was more to there was more for me to to learn. I I needed to progress. Um, I, yeah, I mean, the, I guess like the title technically was a, a, a step down, but um, actually, I, I felt I felt pretty uh, I felt pretty fortunate uh, being able to land where I did. Uh, in fact, the company that that we started um, a- after Evlo, so so One Piece was uh, ended up being a, a, a huge win. You know, I, I started that with uh, with Vicky Lee. Uh, in Dafu Gao, and we scaled to 12 locations. It was a, a co-working space. And we were doing, when I left three years later, we were doing 3 million in revenue and we had raised 15 million. And uh, yeah, I got to, you know, that was, became kind of like a foundational element of, of myself and, and, uh, and, and my, my brand and, and how I could be valuable to a, a lot of people. Um, yeah. And how did you do that? So you were there at One Piece for two years and nine months, right? So how mm-hmm. did you, what was, what happened then? Did you decide to to move out or did you, what, did the company get sold? How do you make the change once you have a, I mean, the company was being successful. Why would you change? I was ready for a new opportunity and we have already been doing that for about three years. And um, well, it was fascinating to build a, an ecosystem of physical locations uh, and, and by the way, there was over 600 startups across those uh, locations. They they were all looking at us because everybody needs capital or new customers or team or what have you. Um, but it was kind of, it was time for a new opportunity. And and uh, a, a, a friend of mine had said, "Hey, you know, I have this idea for uh, essentially automating the um, the content that goes out on these channels uh, for, for social media, it's essentially AI Martech." And I said, "Hey, I, I love the idea. Let's let's build it." Um, so that's kind of how that happened. Also, sort of dodged a bullet because that was a year before the pandemic, which obviously was uh, pretty hard on uh, physical locations, right? Yeah, no, you. That sounds great. But was it tough to get make the change? How did you go back to the founder and say, "Listen, I I want to make a, I'm leaving." How did was it hard to go into her and or and say, "Listen, I'm I'm going to be leaving the company." No, because she, Vicky Lee is, you know, she's a wonderful woman. In fact, she was a, a co-founder, but also kind of a, kind of a coach. Um, so we're still friends and she knew that I could continue to be valuable to the organization. Um, in, in fact, it's kind of a fun story when, so Vicky um, was, here's, here's an example of why she's a, just a, like a, a great friend and a great leader. Um, we were hosting an event. There was a couple of VIPs that came in. We had about a hundred people show up and food and drink. And I just didn't manage that very effectively. Um, and it was, it was a, it was a cluster, you know, people, people were late. I was juggling things. I was stressed out and Vicky knew that was going to happen, but she let it happen. So I could go through that process and, and, and learn. And then later she sat me down. She's like, so why do you think that happened? And I, you know, moving forward was much more careful in that capacity. So glad she invested in me as a, as a friend and a, and a co-founder. No, that's great. So let's start. So you went, so you went down through um, one piece, then you moved over to Willow. So what was Willow all about? Right. So um, if you think of, if you think of social media as, as a way to go fishing, uh, you, ha- you got to have good bait, 
right? So LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, those are the four channels we focused on. Um, uh, and in fact, this kind of dovetails into what, what we were talking about a little bit for, for the show about leading with value. So um, essentially, if, if, you, if you create a product or if you have a service or some combination of that, uh, it's, it's good to be visible. Um, and as long as you have personalized, unique, valuable content, you know, you keep people laughing and learning, then these channels can be really valuable. Um, in fact, I see you on LinkedIn quite a bit, Gary, with GSD Ventures, and I, I have to imagine that helps with your deal flow. Yeah, I mean, the situation, I just love it. You know, I've been doing this stuff for a long time, and during the pandemic, when we couldn't do it, there was there weren't a lot of options. It was really nice to get together with folks. So, you know, we started yeah. out. Right. Then people, you know, started to say, well, it's really great. Um, why don't you do a show? And then we started doing a show, and now, you know, about a thousand podcasts later, here we are. Wow, brilliant. I love it. So you went down through, you did the willow, you were there two years. And again, you you did two years and 10 months. You seem to like that that right before three years, Mark. Uh, so you, you moved down and then you did, um, you're a, a startup mentor. What is IMEC all about? Yeah, so um, IMEC is a is a chip manufacturer out of Belgium. They're, uh, they have a, they're a billion dollar company, but they also have a, a, a startup program that's kind of like the Y Combinator of Europe. Um, and given the fact I had gone through the program with the with the Willow team, in fact, they were our first 50,000. They were our first check um, and super helpful. Um, they asked me to come back and, and be a mentor. Um, throughout my career, it's kind of an, in an interesting dynamic. I've been valuable to teams that are abroad and coming to the Bay Area um, just because I, you know, I know the nuances, I got the community and, and that, that seems to be a, a pretty consistent thing, which is, which is fun. Yeah. So you did that and you were your startup mentor. So, and now you're doing, um, you got your Silicon Zombies podcast. What's all that all about? What's Silicon Zombie, Zombies all about? Silicon Zombies, well, we, uh, we demystify emerging technology with the best brains in the Bay. Now, it, we say we call it zombies because we love brains, right? Like smart people. Um, but it's not always the best brains in the Bay because it's we have people from all over the world. In fact, just uh, so it's every Tuesday at 5 p.m. And um, we had we had Peter Zajac, who's the, the CEO of Untitled Kingdom. Um, and he's from he's from Poland. But we really have people from all over. But the idea is to nourish the startup community. Um, and then keep people again laughing and learning, and uh, we want to lead with value. And, and you know, we have a lot to learn, but we're having we're having fun. That's for sure. Now, who's the most interesting guest that you had on the show? Ooh, um, there are so many. There's so many. I think I would probably say Drew Freeman. So Drew is. The, uh, he's on the board of Sand Hill Angels. Um, he's a, a semiconductor guy um, and had a very successful career. Um, but like you, he's he's down to earth and approachable, even though he's been wildly successful. Now, Drew, keep in mind, he's, he, even though he's a rock star, he prepared for about five weeks before the show. And there were several iterations of, hey, should we talk about this? We should talk about that. He ended up uh, talking specifically about the startup ecosystem in Africa and uh, did research and interviews before the show to be most valuable to, on the show. And we just consistently have had a, a bunch of folks reach out and say, this is what a brilliant episode, the dynamic, the energy. In fact, on that show, we had Musa Dow, who's from the Ivory Coast, join, as well as Steve Weimer, uh, who, has, who has also done a couple dozen investments in Africa like um like drew uh, by the way steve was uh, worked in the senate for over 10 years and he was a, a vice president at ebay and and next door and also just a wonderful human being he's president of the boys and girls club so it's sometimes you just you get magic when you bring the right people together but you know i'm, I'm preaching in the choir there gary i'm sure you know that yeah no i you know i had uh, a four-star admiral on my show the number two guy in the u.s military and um 
you know, it was very interesting. And one is, you know, how do you become an admiral, right? When did you decide to become an admiral? He said, well, yeah. I got a movie uh, when I was a kid and I saw him in dress whites and I said, I'm going to wear that uniform. And it was uh, one of these World War II movies. And then, you know, so I had that conversation and I was just curious. I said, what does it take to lead? And he said, well, he said, compassion and empathy. And I said, well, can you give me an example? He said, well, during Operation Desert Storm. Yeah. Uh, he was running the, um, I guess, the Sixth Fleet. It was one of the, 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 the um, whatever the fleet is in the Middle East, he was running the fleet. And he said, I was down in the hangar deck. And I knew that 10% of the people that were going to be coming out of there were going to probably die, right? So, and I was going to be the one that was going to have to write their their mothers and fathers and wives yeah. and, and their families. And he said, and I had a tear run down my eye. You know, I literally started to cry and thinking about, you know, um, how this was going to be. And um, so he said, compassion and empathy. If people know that you care about them and, uh, and they can feel it, they they want to work with you. They want to help you. They want to be mm -hmm. part of that, um, yeah. that organization, that team. And he said, that was the most important. Wow. And yeah, that was incredible. And then I had a Ford uh, slash elite model on who's an actress. Oh. And I said to her, I said, I mean, she's gorgeous. Drop dead gorgeous. And if you're listening, Zen, hello. Uh, <laughs> and I said to her, well, how is it? I mean, you're that beautiful. How is it? Um, she said, well, you know, I had two times I got sick. One time I was in New York and I fell down through those little metal plates that are on the um, on the sidewalk where they lift stuff up and down. Somebody had one open. It was broken. And she went down. Like a like man. But it's like, you know, where they for the shops, they go down to the basement and they take stuff out that way. They're like, right. oh, yeah, yeah. OK. I don't know what, you know, like a cover where they, they have like a little uh, elevator that goes up and down and takes stuff mm -hmm. down. She fell down and got a lot of stitches. And so she was out of commission for a couple of years. And she said, I wasn't beautiful. You know, I, I had all these stitches all over. And then she got sick, very, very uh, deathly ill. And she was out because of that. And she said, you know, you appreciate what you have. Right, right, right. right. And then, you know, you're no better uh, than anybody else that's out there. And he, she grew up in uh, Montreal in Canada. She was Greek or French. And uh, she said, I learned that lesson. She said, and again, compassion, right? And empathy. It was interesting. You hear that a lot. And sometimes, sometimes we forget about it. Nick, it's uh, yeah. I, the United Nations uh, for the 76th assembly a year ago. And, um, you know, I talked about technology and uh, how we can use technology as a tool for peace, right? We got to figure out how to work together. This planet and, has so many challenges, yeah. you know, and, you know, killing each other. There are 200 active conflicts around the world today, but how can we help feed each other? How can we help make right. this world a better place, a cleaner, nicer, better place, instead of just, you know, being on this journey, we got to figure out. That's how right. we, and I hear that a lot, actually. I hear that Te from high technology. We can, we can do it through technology. That's right? it. We can do it through technology, but we got to apply it. It's not just about the money, right? It's about how can we do it? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, just yesterday, a uh, great point, by the way, Gary. Just yesterday, I was I was talking with uh, a founder that has created a a, a way to uh, stimulate plants through through sound waves. So it's like tiny speakers that makes them grow twice as fast. So a certain frequency uh, uh, grows the the stomata, so like the cellular plant hallway. So the, the nutrients get delivered more efficiently. Um, so it takes less water and all the rest of it. So I mean, that would be one approach to solving like the, the food problem. Um, another interesting uh, do doing good, but also doing well uh, technology application is the idea where you can actually um, predict violence. Uh, a, a friend of mine was reading a, a, a document or, or a, a study rather about how uh, there's a lot of parallels between the spread of disease and the spread of violence. Um, and, uh, it, and if we can if we can attack in a similar way, then we could stop huge problems like genocide, for example. Yeah, no, and we need to do that, right? We need to go down through, by 2050. We have to double the food supply to feed everybody, and we can't increase the number of cows because 26 percent of the pollution is methane gas from cows. So, right. <clears throat> got to use plant based protein. So, I mean, these yeah. are the kind of things we need to look at. I mean, for God's sake, we couldn't get a roll of toilet paper during the pandemic. 
And, uh, you know, here we have quantum computers. So what's wrong with that picture? I mean, we ought to be looking at, like, keep it simple. We ought to be out looking at these things and figuring out how we can live better. I mean, the average temperatures around the world by the end of this century could be up 7 degrees Fahrenheit. 80% wow. of the fresh water in the world is located in Antarctica. Now, if we keep going on the same trajectory we are now, a good part of Florida is going to be underwater by the end of this century. Places of Mumbai of, uh, what, 4 million people are also going to be underwater. We need to change. And, you know, we look at um, the Gulf Stream, the Gulf Stream slowing down. I remember I worked on a project with a guy named Irving Crick. He told me this back in the early 90s. He said that, that you know, you're going to see temperatures in about 2010, 2020, temperatures are going to go up. But he said, Gary, you're going to see days where it's over 100 degrees Fahrenheit in uh, the UK, in London. And I'm like, yeah, Dr. Crick, I lived in London. It doesn't mm -hmm. get low. He said, you're going to see, you're going to see it. You're going to hear about it. Um, and this year it was over 100 degrees, 105 degrees Fahrenheit. It was summertime. Mm -hmm. Also, he said, snow he called it and why is that important it means the gulf stream slowing down right mm -hmm. the chain so and he said one day it's just going to stop and then everything changes so what what percentage of gt ventures uh are companies that are focused around climate tech roughly as many as we can get yeah i mean the situation is many it's uh you know we're looking for them but there aren't that many out there to be honest yeah. with you it's I had the lead author, the Nobel, right? So 2007, they won the Nobel Prize uh, for climate. They did it with Al Gore and uh, Sebastian Rao. And uh, we had the discussion about it. I mean, this is like, you know, if we don't do something soon, it's going to so dramatically impact humanity, right? The breadbaskets of the world are going to move up. The breadbaskets are going to be Canada, right? Northern U.S. and Russia. Mm -hmm. And that's it. You know what I mean, and what happens with everybody else? Then the water supplies, right? The water supplies, water's evaporating. Look at Lake Mead. It's what, at 26% of the levels that it should be today. But these kind of yeah. things, we, you know, we can use technology, Nick, to solve a lot of these challenges. And, you know, when you look at it, you look at, so in terms of the percentage of companies, I mean, as many as we can get, I don't know, 5%, yeah. something like okay. that. The problem is people don't reward them. It's not like something that, you know, unless it's an impact fund, you know, where what's their exit going to be? Who's going to buy the company? Right. You know what I mean? Right. That's the problem. How do we go down through? And, you know, you've been in the Valley for a long time. I mean, is it about money? Is it about social impact? What is it here? What do people really look at? What's the bottom line? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's different for everybody. And it's probably not one or the other. I manage the sliding scale between those. Um You know, I think we we certainly are are a little bit more uh, conscious, um, and it, maybe that's just because kind of politically or you know or, or, or whatever. But um, I'd like to think that the things that people are building, the things that people are, are focused on, are a little bit higher level. Um, my friend Brian Talibi just turned forty. Instead of having a a, a party. He had a, a Future of Humanity Summit in Vegas, and this was probably like two months ago. And uh, it was at the, the Black Eyed Peas house, and there was about 200 plus people from all over the world that came in, politicians, uh, musicians, technologists, investors, and there was a ton of talks. In fact, uh, Reese Jones, who's co-founder of uh, Singularity University, uh, and, um, among other people spoke, including uh, the, the Firefly guys, the, the rocket company, uh, Jeff Bezos is co-founder, and the whole idea was uh, how can we uh, how can we approach these huge looming challenges uh, to to ensure the the future of, uh, of of humanity. And so I think like that kind of ethos. I mean, yeah, that happened in Vegas, but a lot you know the lion's share of the people were from from the Bay. You know that kind of ethos and that that uh, approach is uh, I think it's it's beautiful and it's it's pretty cool to be part of. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, but, you know, actions speak louder than words. You know, the next step is what can we really do, right? It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. I spoke at the United Nations last year about technology as a tool for peace. Um, I spoke at the 76th Assembly. And, I may, I, and, of course, coming in as an entrepreneur, it was a little bit different than a politician. But I said, guys, literally, 
Why don't we figure out how we can create jobs so people don't go to a place like Boko Haram and ISIS? Create jobs. People want to feed their families. That's Seriously. Right. And if you take care of that, a lot of things. I mean, Maslow's hierarchy of needs works for a lot of different reasons. But if you yeah. take care of the, the physical needs of the individuals, it surely is going to help. Let's go down through, through and figure out. Let's start from square one on a positive note. And I think we've got that opportunity today. And we got to do something about it, right? Yeah, yeah. So tell me a little bit about Unity Central, what you're doing with Unity Central. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, it's essentially knowledge management. So uh, it, the ability to, um, well, he, here's, a, here's a good example. Uh, so for, for Meta or for Facebook, they ship a lot of their, their headsets, the, the Oculus. So we manage the supply chain logistics. So when it gets manufactured, it shipped, delivered, uh, every step along the way, we run in our, essentially, uh, it's an operating system. You can think of it as kind of like an augmented brain that ha that's based in a, in, a, in a blockchain technology or a distributed ledger. And so there's, a, there's a, the ability to kind of have total transparency and collaboration. So uh, the data is, is actionable, for, for example. So like, everything's a process, right? And we can, we can uh, verify whether or not the blueprint or like the ideal outcome and, and process and the steps matches reality. And when it doesn't match, um, or when it doesn't match, we can we can send notifications to the appropriate party. Uh, but so when it does, me, we can automate explain a lot. Explain that to me again. When it doesn't match reality, tell me that one. Tell sure. us that one. Time. Sure, sure. So um, let's think about it as like if you're building a building a house. You've got the blueprint, so you like you've got the the ideal process, and then you've got reality, like what's actually happening. We're capturing data points on each of those processes. In a process, when we wake up in the morning, you, you make your bed, you eat breakfast, you get dressed, and, and you head off to work. Um, so when one of those processes, when one of those steps isn't isn't completed correctly, in this case, it could be a purchase order, and where the the, the engine reads the, the the price and the location and the amount and so on and so forth, um, then we can send a notification. But if it does, and we could essentially automate that step. So you're sending notifications at each one of the steps, yeah? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a kind of a, a simplified uh, uh, way to describe it, but it's yes, yeah, pretty. It's pretty uh, yeah, great. Pretty so how what's going on with the company? I mean, you're the chief revenue officer. How's business? Business is good. It's uh, in fact, we we just hired a, a, a new engineer yesterday. Uh, shout out to Hylon, welcome, and uh, we're. We have a, a, a bunch of really neat projects going. In fact, uh, the day before last, we had uh, had had lunch with the vice president of sales. Excuse me, had dinner with the the VP of ISV at uh, at Salesforce. So potentially working on a, a project with these guys and getting on the App Exchange. And um, it's we're trying to figure out how to how to how to focus and not do too much at the at the same time, right? No, that's great. Well, it sounds like you're having fun. So, what do you do for fun, Nick? What do you uh, do? For fun? You got surfing. And, yeah, and I'm, I'm very passionate about about uh, surfing big waves. And um, for whoever's listening, if you wanna if you wanna learn, I have extra boards and wetsuits. And uh, let's see, I love I love doing art as well. So uh, you know, recently what I've been doing is like uh, animation. So um, on the iPad. So you, you draw one picture and then you change it slightly and then you change it slightly and you get like this pretty cool uh, moving effect. So yeah, I'm just, it's kind of fun. Oh, that's great. Now I got a yeah. question. When you're out there surfing, do you surf down in Santa Cruz? Oh yeah, as much as I can. Do you ever see sharks down there? Uh, I've been surfing probably on average once or twice a week ever since I was 12 and I'll be 37 in, a, in two days. And I've only seen uh, a shark essentially twice. One, I, I saw a, a great white at Steamer Lane, and it was about 40, 50 feet away. It was a big fin that just cruised right by. That was crazy. It actually wasn't. That's... What did you do when you saw that fin coming up? I, I, I was just, I was amazed. I was, I've been kind of obsessed with sharks ever since I was a kid. So I looked to the fellow next to me, and I said, did you, did you see that? And he's like, yeah, that's amazing. He goes, we should go in. But we just like stayed there and we like kept watching it, you know. <laughs> oh my God. That's, well, here's the deal, you know. 
you know, uh, and I've seen a lot of sharks too down in Florida. Uh, and, you know, it's not about what's up underwater. I'm concerned about what's underwater. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, my my wife for my birthday last year got me this. Uh, it it kind of looks like a like an Apple Watch, but it's uh, it goes around your ankle and it just has magnets in it, and it's a uh, supposedly creates this force field uh, that that sharks don't like. Um, sharks have uh, these these things all over their body, and especially in their nose, called Lorenzi de ampullae. And mm -hmm. they sense uh, electromagnetic movement, um, and this kind of disrupts that. But you know what's funny, Gary? In the in the instructions, it says uh, uh, does not protect against great white sharks due to their unique ambush style of attack. I think, well, that's oh, the only God. flavor that I'm worried about. You know, that's okay though. <laughs> the other time I saw a shark was a, a, a tiger in, in Hawaii a couple of years ago. Well, tigers, you know, I've, tigers, uh, they're bad. They actually start to go around in circles when you're in the water. They they take these concentric rings and they start to make them smaller and smaller and take little, yeah. you know, bites out of you. Yeah, they're, nice. they're nasty. I'll tell you what else is really interesting. We have bull sharks, and I've seen a number of them in Florida. They live in the rivers like the, um, the uh, brackish water. They can live in fresh water and salt water. And so we have these... Um, bull sharks and they're they're just i mean they're aggressive they're just um nasty sharks they'll come after you right yeah, it's, yeah. You know, most of the time the sharks are not coming after you they're not you know they're not um, purposely uh coming at you but those bull sharks are really really nasty <laughs> very very but, aggressive oh, tons, of, tons of testosterone now i got a question another one Nick, did you ever think about orcas? There's a lot of orcas out there, you know, and you see them in the free world and all that. And I'm thinking to myself when I, and I go down to Santa Cruz and go out in the kayaks and stuff myself. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm not really that afraid of a shark, but man, those orcas are really smart. <laughs> but, you know, I, there's, there's, vid, there's drone footage um, showing orcas just, just terrorizing these great whites, which is such a weird thing to think about. But there's never been a, a, a reported attack of, of an orc on a human. Thank God, because those things are gnarly. Like yeah, that. no, that's amazing. I remember I was down in Santa Cruz one time and they said there were uh, uh, humpback whales, orcas, uh, sharks. There was like the like a perfect storm of different critters around the water. Yeah, and I wanted yeah. to go out right with my daughter and we took our uh, kayaks out. And we're going out there. And I said, you know, maybe this is not the smartest idea in the world. <laughs> Gary, would you ever go uh, shark diving, like in a in a cage? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. I mean, I would go in Florida. I would go down. I have one of those torpedoes and go underwater uh, snorkeling. And, wow. you know, I specifically would go out and look. There are a lot of, uh, you know, well, there's black tip reef sharks. They migrate south. There's nurse sharks or some it's just beautiful you know barracudas uh moray eels all kinds of critters down there and generally yeah. as long as you don't fool with them or if they're territorial like a barracuda they don't bother you or you don't want to wear anything shiny as you know right nothing right, shiny. Right, exactly exactly you know what i'm thinking you're some uh some fish <laughs> you know i speaking of uh, uh underwater sea adventures and stories i when i was getting my my open water my advanced open water, you have to do a hundred foot dive, uh, a triangulation to be able to do navigation uh, and in uh, a night dive. And the night dive was actually kind of scary, but it was very unique. Um, I was about 30, 40 feet down and we were with a group of people and we all, you know, those glow sticks, you can like crack them and then yeah, 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 yeah. we duct taped that to the, your, to your snorkel and you're down there and uh, so you could see like these little floating orbs, which is kind of neat. And I took my uh, my flashlight out. And keep in mind, it's like pitch black, but you can hear like it's uh, it's so unique. It's like you hear the bubbles, but it's also very calming in a strange way. Um, so I took my flashlight out. I turned it on, and it like it opened almost like a lightsaber because there's like stuff floating around. And so like there's this this big like. Uh, jet of light right in front of me and uh, i held it there for a second and you know what popped out right in front of me was uh was an octopus you know it's about the size really? of my, and it was like a foot maybe two from my nose 
And this thing just very gracefully came right in front of me. It was just, I felt like I was on the Discovery Channel. So much. Wow, that's great. That must be really it, cool. And I, I, touched, I touched it and it shot ink at me and, and darted off. And I was like, wow, this is, I will never forget this moment. And I've always been really just enamored with the, with the, uh, with the ocean for sure. Well, it sounds like you have a great time, you know, and uh, it's great to have you on the show. We're, we're actually a few minutes over, but it's been great today. So closing yeah. thoughts and how do people get a hold of you, Nick? Ah, uh, yeah, thanks. Um, well, I'm on LinkedIn, so feel free to give me a holler there um, and uh, check out Zil Silicon Zombies Tuesdays at 5 p.m. On, on LinkedIn. And thanks, Gary, for letting me do a plug there. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Nick, for joining us. So, and thanks to all my viewers out there for joining one more time to GST Presents Silicon Valley AI and Tech. Stay happy, stay safe, and stay healthy. I'll see you again next Tuesday for another exciting edition. Take care, everybody, and see you soon. Thanks, Nick. My pleasure. Take, Take care, care. Bye -bye. See you.